Good evening, everyone. Can everybody hear me okay? Hopefully, uh, <laughs> had a couple of technical difficulties last week, so I'm hoping for hoping for none this week. You never know for sure, but uh, live streaming is always a little bit of an adventure, but good to see everybody here. So um, what I'm going to be doing for this week, um, I'm going to be talking um, during tonight's class about some of what's coming up uh, next week. But, um, you know, there were, there's some questions I've gotten where it's like it really is going to take me a long time to work through them. And then I've gotten several questions that I can answer, I think, um, not super quickly, but, you know, like I, I think I could knock out several of them in one session. Uh, so our content tonight is going to be a good bit uh, more varied than it has been in other weeks. We've typically stuck with one topic. Tonight, I'm going to be in several different places. So we're going to call tonight the uh, rapid fire round. And so uh, I'm just going to start jumping into some of these. Uh, I'm going to start with a question about extraterrestrials. Um, one person basically just asked, what is you know, I guess what's the what's the Christian stance on them? What are our thoughts on them? And um, Truthfully, it's kind of hard to know, isn't it? Uh, there's not that much to work with. Uh, what I thought I would show you, um, sometimes in Scripture, there are passages that people read kind of through the lens that they want to see. So I would mention that there are some passages um, in Job, for example, where people try to make something about mythological creatures that were kind of understood in Job's time. They'll try to make that be about dinosaurs, for example, to put dinosaurs in the Bible. Like We have different ways sometimes we'll use a scripture for a purpose we want to use it for. Uh, that has happened some, uh, for example, in Ezekiel chapter 1. Um, there's this description. <laughs> Thank you, Diana. Real, real men wear meta. I agree. Um, so there's this description of the living creatures. Uh, I saw a will on the earth beside the living creatures, uh, one for each of the four of them. As for the appearance of the wheels and their construction, their appearance was like the gleaming of beryl, uh, and the four had the same likeness, their appearance and construction being, as it were, a wheel within a wheel. And when they went, they went in any of their four directions without turning as they went. And their rims were tall and awesome, and the rims of all four were full of eyes all around. And so they see this description, and they say, ah, this really looks like a flying saucer. Um, I'm just, uh, <laughs> Kevin is asking, yeah, if you saw, my, um, if you saw my, my post on Facebook, I'm having a little fun. Would love to challenge any of you to kind of tease your hair out and see just how much you've got at this point uh, from the coronavirus restrictions. But um, so looking at this passage, this is a passage that if you were looking for UFOs in the Bible, you might could look at this and find some semblance of that. Now, I'll tell you, this is a super weird passage. Uh, what's it actually doing? Um, has something to do with the idea of God being kind of present in all directions at all times, right? You've got kind of the four winds involved and the four um, wheels, and it's like God has eyes on every side. So this is kind of a weird sci-fi sounding way to represent the way that God is you know, moving in all things and sees all things. And some would even say that just the way in your life, you're kind of spinning your own wheel. God is like that wheel within the wheel who's, who's operating within you. So this would be an example of a passage that a conspiracy theorist would maybe try to use to talk about UFOs when, in fact, I don't think that's at all what uh, he's dealing with. So that's one example. Um, just in general, um, Scripture doesn't really talk about aliens. Uh, that's not something that shows up. Uh, I would say, as Christians, uh, we very much want to affirm that there is a transcendent dynamic to the world we're living in. Uh, there is a spiritual side of, our, of ourselves and of the world we live in. Um, N.T. Wright will talk about this in kind of the modern setting, the way that everyone tries to repress everything spiritual and say that if I can't see it or touch it, it doesn't exist. He says it's kind of like these pipes underneath the city, like, like there's this great city and all these pipes, and pressure is just building and building and building. And so every once in a while, when there's a place where the pressure can break through, it gets kind of out of control and, and, and wild looking. But he says that's the way things are right now, the way that everyone's trying to repress uh, and ignore the spiritual nature of their being. That there is more to this life than what we can see with our eyes. 
However, um, yeah, Cheryl's referencing Chariot of the God. I, you know, Cheryl, I thought about referencing that book, but I just don't want to spend any time talking about it because it's total garbage, right? Uh, but this is a book that looks at things like the Ark of the Covenant, and I can't even remember what he's trying to make the case for, but like the way this was built would actually generate electricity, which would power this, and it's it's all really, you know, science fiction, uh, but it's their attempt to kind of bring the Bible into it. So yeah, thanks for mentioning that one, Cheryl. I thought about it. I just, I don't want to dedicate too much time to it. Um, but one book that I would recommend, if you're a big fan of science fiction, uh, C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien had this, um, they were talking, you know, they're good friends uh, over there in Oxford, and they were talking about how there just needed to be some better science fiction literature. Tolkien, of course, writing Lord of the Rings and all this great fantasy literature, but they gave each other a challenge to write some good science fiction literature and basically like flipped a coin over one of them was supposed to do time travel, the other was supposed to do space travel. So the way that the coin fell, C.S. Lewis got space travel, and he wrote his space trilogy. Tolkien got time travel, and he just never delivered the goods. But uh, C.S. Lewis has three books. I would encourage you to start with Paralandra. If you like science fiction, this is imagining space travel as if we were to travel to Mars right at the time that their Adam and Eve are kind of inhabiting the world as it's been created. It's just a really unique way to view a lot of things. It's a deeply Christian novel, but it's actually legit good Christian science fiction. So rather than spend a lot of time worrying about aliens, I would say look at uh, look at C.S. Lewis's stuff. But yeah, unfortunately, we just don't know. Um, I don't think it's wise to invest too much time and energy into conspiracy theories and things that we can't ultimately uh, measure or account for. Uh, I would say as kind of a side note, it's interesting to me that a lot of the people who want to be really hard on the sciences uh, will actually be open to some of this stuff. Like I had a quote, I, I, I should have looked it up for this class, but um, Richard Dawkins, in fact, you know, wanting to affirm that, um, you know, we there is no God, no one put us here, there was not a creator, but then there's this one clip of him kind of speculating, well, you know, it is possible maybe there were alien life forms that put us here, but of course they would have evolved by evolution and kind of come from nothing. You know, he, he at the root of all things, he doesn't want God to be there, but he's actually more open to the idea of aliens than he was to the idea of God. So again, there's not a lot of evidence uh, of that at all, but it's interesting to me the way that people who are known for being kind of into the hard sciences would, uh, would be that way. Um, yeah, okay, got some, <laughs> yeah, Journey, The Will in the Sky, good good uh, classic rock reference. Uh, yeah, uh, good good stuff. Uh, yeah, Bonnie's also mentioning there's the song we sing about God being the will in the middle of the will. Uh, we sing the song, but do we ever talk about what it means? It's good something to think about, isn't it, Bonnie? All right, so, um, yeah, I'm sorry I can't give you more to work with on aliens. I would just say if anyone's trying to show you aliens in your Bible, I'd be highly suspicious, but be very open to the idea of God's supernatural presence at work in the world that we live in, uh, because I think if God had not acted in our world, we would not be here breathing, talking, communicating, thinking independently, abstractly. Uh, these are all things that come from God. Uh, okay, so second question. Someone asked me to talk about Christians and judging. And I believe they were asking, is it like, you know, is it okay to judge an action and not a person? I think that's an okay distinction to make. Um, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to pull up several different passages of Scripture that relate to judging, just to look at a few of these with you. Uh, one would be in Luke chapter 6. Um, Luke chapter 6. Okay, am I in your way? Okay, I'm going to, indulge me for a moment, I'm going to shrink myself so that you can see around my head here. Here we go. Uh, so Jesus says, judge not and you will not be judged. A lot of people want to stop right there, right? And they'll use that as a way to say, in my life, I want to do whatever I feel like doing and I don't want to have to listen to anything that you have to say about it. And they're just treating it like judge not is just an absolute command. No matter what, you shouldn't judge. Uh, that's not really what Jesus is saying because you have to keep reading and see what else he says. Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. So here's the real key of this verse, down at the end of verse 38. This is the part everyone should fixate on. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. So what Jesus is teaching is that there's this reciprocal dimension to how God 
judges us and evaluates us. What he's saying is, if you're going to judge, you should expect that the same criteria get applied to you. So a few years ago, I was talking, um, there was a family that I was working with, and it was a younger family, and they're having a pretty heated argument about if something were to happen to us, which set of grandparents would raise our child, right? And so this is a, this is a kind of a core level subject of deep concern. And he felt like his parents should get the kid and she felt like her parents should get the kid. And as the argument went, one said to the other, I just don't see how you could be so judgmental. Isn't it wrong to be judgmental? And the other spouse was coming to me for advice and just said, but isn't it the case that, I mean, if I'm sorry, but if someone is looking at raising my child, I'm gonna judge them to the core. And, and not to a standard other than I would expect for myself, but yeah, I want to look at every aspect of who they are, if they're going to be responsible for, for the soul of my child. Um, and I think that's fair, that we sometimes do need to evaluate things. And in fact, to take any stance at all, to take any moral stance, is by definition to exclude other options from what you now consider moral. So if I say this is the right thing to do, um, implicit in that are several things that are now not the right thing to do. So there's a lot of things we do that just, just by virtue of being a Christian, saying, I believe that Jesus is the way, I'm by definition saying that other ways are not the way. Uh, and so you can't get away from evaluating choices, evaluating options, evaluating uh, what's good and better and best. Uh, I think the Apostle Paul says very wisely, you know, everything is permissible, not everything is beneficial. Uh, it's worth asking the question many times, not just whether I can, but whether I should. Uh, if I were to take this course of action, I mean, there's a lot of actions I could take and I could justify, but which is the action that produces the most good for the church or for my life? Uh, so we can evaluate in terms of good, better, and best. Uh, so that's one passage about judgment that I think often gets misused because nobody bothers to read the next verse. Um, John chapter 7 and verse 24, look, when Jesus simply says, do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. So Jesus even says, he, in this verse, he's actually telling you to judge. He just tells you kind of the right way to do it. Uh, so I want to show you two other verses that I find to be um, really in, insightful and align well with each other. And we are getting some good uh, comments rolling in here as well. Um, yeah, Connie's talking about the difference in trying to discern versus being judgmental. Yeah, it's one thing to be making personal attacks on another person. It's another thing to be really trying to evaluate. Yeah, what is what is the good thing to do here? What is the best thing to do here? So um, I'm going to show you two other passages. One is from Proverbs chapter 26. So look at what <laughs> whoever wrote these down. I'm assuming it's Solomon. I have to look at the title of this uh, chapter to be sure. But look at these two verses. Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest you be like him yourself. Immediately followed by, answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. So, which is it, right? Do you answer the fool or do you not answer the fool? Because here's scripture, back-to-back -back verses telling you to do the opposite thing. And so I really believe that Paul must have been thinking about that passage when he wrote Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1, which says... Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Doesn't that sound an awful lot like this passage? Like, if you go after him, be very careful that you're not guilty of the same thing that you're going after. But if you just leave someone in their error and don't make an effort to restore them compassionately, then you might just leave them to their folly. So he's saying if there's transgression, um, if you're a spiritually minded person and you know better, right, you're making a good judgment, as Jesus would say, very gently, very humbly, you'd want to try and restore that person. But as you do it, um, keep an eye on yourself. Uh, Dale Carnegie would say, uh, keep an eye uh, on, on your own faults. If you have to talk to someone else about a problem you have with them, uh, begin by telling your story about a time you've struggled with the same thing. So, so stay humble in your own eyes. Don't look to get into God's seat of ultimate judgment, but uh, be very humble as you uh, approach that. So uh, those are some verses I would want to bring into that uh, topic of judging. Um, I would just say, 
All of us have to make evaluations from time to time. We've been talking about being humble. And I would say if you have to correct someone, it's important to speak about their actions and not to make um, attacks on a person's character. I mean, you can do it, but it's not received well. So kind of getting back into that um, thing I was talking about a minute ago of, um, you know, there are things you could do, like everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. And I would say if you have a problem with something that someone has done, and your first move is to go right for the personal attack, or you're really just a scumbag, or you what? How are your priorities so screwed up? You know, you got to get closer to someone to find out why they do the things that they do. So um, I would say, especially in like conflicts with family or close friends, uh, church members, it's helpful to keep things focused at the level of the action itself. Because the truth is, no matter how well you know me, you never really, really know why I do the things that I do. Right? You can you can see my actions, you can evaluate whether my actions were helpful or not helpful, but you don't get to tell me what's going on in my heart or what my motive was. Really, that's only between a person and God, and you just have to trust you know whatever they say their motive is, unless you have really, really good belief, reason uh, to believe otherwise. So this is a formula you might could use. Uh, in counseling, they would call this like the ABC formula. Part A is when you do such and such, right? So here's the action. When you do this action, when you have done something like this, B is it makes me feel this way. So this is what your action was. This is how I felt. And you might even be able to diffuse it just by stopping at letter B once they explain it to you. Oh, that's not at all what I meant by that. Well, here's what I was really trying to do, and I'm so sorry it came across this way. A lot of times you can even resolve it at step B. But if you need to take it a step further, step C is simply, it would help me if you would, and then describe a different action. So rather than just making an attack, or rather than just making a complaint, this is an effort to be constructive, where you're saying, this is what I saw you do. I don't know why you did it this way, but this is what you did. This is how I felt myself responding to it. And here's something else you could do that'd be helpful to me. Uh, it's kind of on them how well they respond to that, but I feel like that's about as gentle uh, an approach as you can take in trying to uh, work with a person that has uh, done something you disagree with. So there's some thoughts on judging. Okay, next question. Uh, someone asked uh, as kind of a series of questions about uh, to whom do we direct our prayers when we pray? Um, who do we pray to? And I think what they have in mind is like, uh, especially uh, some of the high church traditions, I'm thinking uh, the Catholics would be probably the most familiar example to a lot of us around here in South Texas, where there is a tendency either to pray to Mary or to certain saints, you know, highly revered uh, people from the church over the centuries. Uh, so I'm going to talk about that a little bit. Okay, so for one, um, this, is, this is an area where I definitely differ with the Catholics quite a bit. Um, when you look at the role of priests in the Old Testament, the reason that you needed priests was because you yourself did not have access to God on your own. So there was a selected tribe, the tribe of Levi, and from the tribe of Levi, um, members who met certain criteria were able to serve in like a priestly function. So I need you to... Um, interact with God on my behalf. But as Christians, we don't have priests anymore. And this was a huge component of what Jesus accomplished on the cross. I think it is terribly unfortunate that the Catholics have opted to call their ministers priests as if people no longer have direct access to God, because this is specifically what Jesus came to accomplish. Jesus is our high priest who removed that barrier and one of the things that they commented on, if you remember, as we've been studying through John, in John chapter 5, they even make the comment on how, you know, Jesus talks about God like his father, making himself like equal to God. Nobody before Jesus, I mean, certainly they prayed to God, and they prayed to God with great reverence and respect, but this fam familial tone that Jesus takes when he prays to God is something that was unprecedented. He talks to God like God's his father. You know, we've just been so spoiled with the blessings of being in Christ where that just seems normal to us. We don't understand how shockingly different it is to be able to pray to God so directly, so intimately, the way that we're taught to do by Jesus himself. Um, I would also notice that like Stephen, the first martyr, for example, 
Stephen, as he's being stoned, looks up into heaven and prays to Jesus. He says, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And so this is an example of Jesus being prayed to. Uh, so just a few kind of anecdotes related to prayer. I would say just uh, just in general, um, this is a, this is kind of a model of the Trinity, right? It's like an impossible thing to wrap your mind around. Um, the Father and the Son and the Spirit are three different things, yet somehow they're all God. And so I would say I'm personally very comfortable addressing prayers to um, any of the members of the Godhead, right? The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, so yeah, this is this is good, Kevin. I thought about meant to reference this passage. First um, Peter chapter two and verse nine. You're a chosen people, royal priesthood, holy nation, God's special possession. So yeah, it, it's when we talk about having priests. I guess the point I was trying to make is. I no longer need an intercessor between myself and God, who's a person, because Jesus occupies that role. Jesus was the high priest. The, the veil of the curtain has been torn in half. Now I have access to God as much as any of the priests did under the old covenant. So yeah, Peter makes this point that we are a royal priesthood, but it's not that there's a priesthood who rules over us, who dispenses the elements of communion or is able to withhold things from us if we don't meet their criteria. We don't have a priesthood in that sense, but in fact, all Christians are now priests. All of us uh, can go to God directly, and we can also intercede with God on behalf of each other. I would challenge you to look through Scripture and see how many times you find um, where Paul will encourage us, for example, that we ought to pray for each other. James will encourage us that we ought to pray for each other, interceding so that our sins could be forgiven. Like, I should be praying that God will forgive you your sins, and you should be praying that God will forgive me of my sins. And Scripture teaches that that has great significance. That's a priestly function uh, to deal with sin on behalf of another. That's what they were doing when they were offering sacrifices. So, yeah, thank you for making that reference, Kevin. I meant to jump on that one myself. Um, yes, and Randall, speaking through Cheryl, is mentioning uh, 1 Timothy 2.5. There's one mediator between God and man, Jesus Christ. That's exactly right. Uh, yeah, I'm going to look at the Romans 8 passage as well, which is kind of talking about Jesus and the Spirit, both having this kind of mediating presence. So getting back to this topic, who do you address prayers to? You can certainly pray to God the Father, God the Son, and I believe also God the Spirit. Now, I think when you're praying to any of those, you're also praying to all of them because even though they're three, they're also one, right? So you can't separate the members of the Trinity apart from each other. Um, so talking about this practice of praying to saints, my understanding of this is that this practice came along when someone would think about maybe one of the great Christian heroes of old or someone that they just knew was in the presence of God. Like this person is deceased, now they're with God. And you might think to yourself, uh, I know that now that that person is in God's presence, you know, I'm praying for myself, but maybe I could talk to them and they would put in a good word for me because surely spoken right there in the presence of God, that would carry a lot of weight and be significant. And so somehow this practice uh, develops. Uh, but as we were just talking about, I think it is the case that Jesus and the Spirit, if you read Romans 8, the Spirit and Jesus are the two who intercede for us with God. The Spirit with these groanings, Jesus telling God to set us free and count us as innocent. Um, but they're in our, uh, they are now our intercessors. We don't need another go between, between ourselves and God. I would also mention probably the most popular form of a prayer to someone who is not God uh, would be the prayers to Mary that have become uh, so popular over the centuries in the Catholic Church. Uh, and in fact, uh, the cult of Mary in the Catholic Church goes way back. Now, we're talking like five, 600 A.D. This is one of the things that made the world so ripe for um, uh, like the, the spread of Islam. The Catholics got to focusing so much on you know, kind of the little rituals and the symbols and, you know, kind of the, all, all, the, all the symbolic stuff that they stopped talking a lot about some of the more practical uh, matters of the faith. And so Muhammad comes along and says, oh, you want to go to heaven? Well, you know, don't eat this, don't eat that, pray this many times a day facing this direction, go this place once in your life. You know, it's just like the simple list of stuff you had to do. And uh, it was somewhat the cult of Mary that really made the world um, easier for Islam to spread back in the day. But this Hail Mary prayer comes out of Luke chapter 1, but if you notice, the angel is not praying to Mary or instructing us to pray to Mary. He's simply greeting her. 
Uh, he's just saying, greetings, um, you full of grace. And uh, he's going to give her this wonderful blessing of knowing she's going to be the mother of our Lord. So I think that Mary has great significance, but just the same, there's no example of treating her as if she's deity. I mean, she was chosen to bear um, the Son of God, but um, very significant person. But you don't see anything in Scripture instructing us that we should address our prayers to her. It is a long-standing tradition, but not one that I think has a basis in Scripture. So I would say um, the point of Jesus coming is that you don't need anyone anymore to go between you and God. So direct your prayers to God and um, wherever the saints are, hopefully at peace, hopefully in the presence of God, let them let them enjoy the rest. Uh, we don't have to get them to interfere with what we have going on down here. Uh, we can let them. We can let them move on and enjoy uh, what God has prepared for them. Okay, that's my thoughts on that. All right. So, um, oh, this is interesting. So Sandy says, I ask Jesus, the source of my righteousness. Uh, to lead me in his paths of righteousness, I ask the Spirit to guide my thoughts and words. And I think that's consistent, Sandy, with a lot of passages uh, of Scripture, uh, that Jesus is the one who has come to show us the way so we can follow in his footsteps, and that the Spirit is here to help us. And uh, we've been looking through the Gospel of John, which says a lot about the way that the Spirit helps us when we try to um, give kind of a testimony of faith on behalf of Christ. So, yeah, that's very nice. Thank you for sharing that, Sandy. Um, all right, so uh, questions about the uh, Holy Spirit. So here's what here's what I got going on. Um, I got a bunch of just kind of random assorted questions about the Holy Spirit, and what I want to do, I want to go quite a bit deeper into this topic. So next week is going to be all Holy Spirit stuff. But what I thought I would do this week is try to answer some of the kind of ancillary questions about a few various topics related to the Spirit. So um, this is going to get into more of the specific what does the Spirit you know, do or not do kind of stuff. Uh, next week we're going to look at a much deeper portrait of what all that involves. So um, I'm very excited about this. Um, I reached out to Leonard Allen. Um, Leonard is now the dean of the Lipscomb Bible Department. Uh, he taught at ACU for many years. He started Leafwood Press, which has now been purchased by ACU Press. Um, easily one of the more respected uh, publishing houses in Churches of Christ. Has put out some phenomenal material. But uh, Leonard is someone I look up to as a friend and mentor. And he just so happens to have written what I think is the best book on the Holy Spirit that the, certainly the Churches of Christ have ever produced. And so he's got this book called Poured Out, and um, they used it, I believe it was last year, as the basis for the entire uh, Pepperdine Bible lectures, like everything centered around some of the ideas that Leonard uh, presented. So um, what's going to happen next week is that Leonard is going to join us uh, to talk with us about some of the ideas from his book. And again, if you are a person who has any questions at all uh, about the Holy Spirit, uh, what I love about Leonard's book is that Leonard, he's needing to offer a correction, right? I think my, my opinion, and I'll just out my opinion, I think in Churches of Christ, we have taken far too uh, restricted a view on what the Holy Spirit can do in the life of the Christian. And I think it's like we're trying so hard not to be Pentecostals, perhaps, that we've gone so far the opposite direction that we're also kind of missing it. Um, Leonard does a nice job of offering a correction that is not an overcorrection. So when you read what Leonard has to say, it's, it's deeply grounded in good thinking and scripture, and he offers a productive, healthy path forward that's not turning a blind eye to anything. And um, again, he's not just like reacting to the reactions, right? So I, I would really encourage you to consider his book, but Leonard is going to join me next week, and I just, I can't tell you how excited I am that he agreed to do that. So uh, even if you don't... Uh, even if you don't know Leonard, um, you should be really excited about this. He is he is just a super quality guy. Uh, so he's going to join us next week. So uh, briefly, these are some of the questions that I'm going to be talking about. Um, some of these that I received, one, like how does one receive the Holy Spirit? Can you um, reject or grieve the Holy Spirit? What is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? And what about miraculous spiritual gifts? Uh, so 
I'm going to try to talk about each of those just briefly tonight as we go. And I've still got quite a bit of time left for this. Uh, so I'll just answer these as straightforwardly as I know how. So you receive the Holy Spirit when you are baptized. Um, one of the reasons I believe this is John chapter 3. This is Jesus talking with Nicodemus, where Jesus says you must be born again. It's that word anothen, born again, from on high. The word kind of means both, th both things. But when he's talking about being born again, he says you have to be born of, and he uses this combined phrase, he says you have to be born of water and spirit. And the way that that's structured in Greek, based on my research into this, it's structured in such a way that those two are intended to be a connected thing. So in some denominations, for example, they will try to teach that, well, you have water baptism and you have spirit baptism baptism. Now, it was the case that you had John's baptism, which was a repentance baptism, and Jesus's baptism, which involves the Holy Spirit. There is that distinction, but what you're seeing in John 3, when Jesus talks about what it means to be born again, to be born of water and spirit, he understands that to, it's like a connected phrase. Uh, so it doesn't say you need to be born of water and then also born of the Holy Spirit. It just says born of water and spirit. They're just kind of joined together in this phrase. Um, so that's part of why I would join the idea of the Spirit being part of baptism after the time of Jesus' uh, resurrection. Um, and then Acts chapter 2, verses 38 and 39. This is where... Um, if Peter ever needed to give clear instructions about becoming a Christian, this would be one of those places that he needed to. He's preached this sermon walking through Israel's history. He gets it up to the time of Jesus and how now they've murdered the Son of God and everyone is just cut to the heart and they say, you know, men and brothers, what do we do? Right? So that's the question. Is there any hope we can be saved? How is it that we're supposed to be saved? And Peter's response is, he says in a second person plural form in the Greek, all, and as a Southerner, he'd say, all y'all need to repent. So all of you repent. And then he says in a third person singular type command, all y'all repent and let each of you be baptized for the forgiveness of sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so when Peter's talking about how we come to Christ, their, their question wasn't how do I get the Spirit? Their question was how do I be saved? So he says you need to repent. Each of you needs to be baptized. And when you've done this, you have the forgiveness of sins and also uh, the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so uh, I would just say that's my understanding of Scripture. And there's more passages we can look at, but um, there's always a very close connection between the Holy Spirit arriving and a person uh, being baptized. And so um, you, know, you can look at the, the book of Acts. We talked about a few weeks ago how a person becomes a Christian. I would just encourage you to kind of uh, work through some of those passages. Uh, to the question, uh, can you reject the Spirit? Um, yes. So the Holy Spirit doesn't take over you and control your actions. We spent a lot of time the other week when we were talking about uh, whether or not we have free will, that God does not force you to do things you don't choose to do. He doesn't make you his robots. Um, so 1 Corinthians chapter 14 says the spirits of prophets are subject to prophets. What that means is someone who had a gift for things prophetic um, had that under control. And so when Paul is giving instructions in uh, 1 Corinthians about the Christian assembly and you know, if you have some of these kinds of gifts, certain people had the ability to speak languages that they'd never studied. He says, if you're going to do that, you need to go one at a time, and you need to only do that if there's someone to interpret. And what he says is, if you uh, don't do that, and an outsider shows up, they're going to think you're a bunch of crazy people. And it's amazing to me the way this has been true. Um, I've watched the way the internet loves to mock uh, some of the real charismatic leaning churches where they just let everyone go wild and out of control, which is contrary to um, the way that Paul says we are to use those gifts if we had them. And um, he says the spirits of prophets are subject to prophets. So if you have the spirit within you, uh, you have a spiritual gift of some sort, um, you have that under control. Uh, you have the ability to use that or to refrain from using that. It's also the case that you can grieve the spirit um, I would just say the way that works in general is that once you become a Christian and the uh, Holy Spirit lives within you, when you do things that you know to be against the will of God, remember the Spirit's right there having to watch it happen. 
right? Like he's, he's within you, living within you. And then you say things with your words, you do things with your body that would bring shame to God and not honor to God. Um, it totally, uh, it makes sense how the spirit would feel grieved, right? God saved you so that you don't have to live as a slave to those kinds of things anymore. So when you revert to all the things you should have been repenting of, um, <clears throat> yeah, I think it, it grieves the spirit uh, for us to do that. So that'd be my answer to that. Uh, can you grieve the spirit? Yes, I think you can. Okay, so the other question was about blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Um, so my quickest possible answer to that question, what does it mean to blaspheme the Holy Spirit? Uh, I've known people who've been so afraid in their life because they thought maybe they accidentally blasphemed the Holy Spirit. Like, you don't, you don't do this on accident. Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is something that's uh, portrayed as a really intentional thing. So looking at Mark chapter 3, this is one of the places Jesus is talking about this. So what's happened is that Jesus has performed these amazing signs, right? The Holy Spirit through Jesus is performing amazing signs. And it says, all the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, he is possessed by Beelzebul, and by the prince of demons, he cast out demons. And so he's saying, can Satan cast out Satan? And how can a house be divided amongst itself, against itself? And so he says, truly I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the children of man, and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they were saying he has an unclean spirit. So, um, as I understand it, blasphemy of the Holy Spirit means that when you are witnessing Jesus perform something miraculous as a sign of God's work through him, you attribute the work of the Holy Spirit to the devil himself. In this context... Jesus just says, you're not going to be forgiven of that. And, I mean, he's the one who's doing the forgiving. So as much as I'd love it to be this zero-sum game where no matter what anyone has ever done, everything is just fine, I do think that's the vast majority of the time. But in this case, Jesus has very harsh things to say for people who would witness the work of the Holy Spirit, know it to be true, and deliberately attribute it to the devil while also remain, you know, retaining this kind of unrepentant heart, right? So God loves a, a contrite heart, and he's merciful towards those who are repentant. But what you're seeing in this passage is not just someone who's made a mistake that they'll be sorry for, but um, they've kind of set their hearts and their minds against Jesus to the point that they'll see the work of God and attribute the work of God to the devil. And they're not going to repent. How can how can any like redemption be possible for them if they're going to persist in this path? So, uh, if you want to understand blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, I I just don't think it's really something we're likely to do in our setting um, to witness something totally miraculous and um, you know deny it. Um, yeah, Kevin is saying uh, Kevin has got a PhD in New Testament studies, by the way, so he's got more credibility than I do on this especially because those religious leaders ought to recognize God's work when it happened right in front of them. Yeah, I mean, that's that's one of the things so frustrating for Jesus we've been seeing in John's gospel. It's like, I'm doing all this stuff right here, and you're still denying it. You know, what, what more do you want? There's nothing more I could do because you've set your hearts on not believing. Um, so that's my thoughts on uh, blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. So one of the other questions I got, someone had some questions about kind of the ecstatic-looking spiritual gifts. So I was referencing some of the charismatic movements. Uh, some of the televangelists are the worst culprits of this stuff. So if you've not seen this video, I, I can't say it's worth your time, but Kenneth Copeland, the big TV multimillionaire televangelist, got a bunch of guys on stage a few weeks ago where he walks around and pronounces judgment on COVID-19. And in this particular shot, he's blowing at the camera and saying, I'm blowing the breath of God on you in COVID-19. I burn you. And he's doing all this really theatrical stuff. And at this point, people have remade it like into a music video. I mean, it's, it's what people do when Christians or people claiming to be Christians act like that. Um, so a lot of times when we think about spiritual gifts, unfortunately, we tend to think mostly in those kinds of categories, you know, the faith healers and some of the, the weirder stuff. Uh, so I want to mention a couple of things that I think could be helpful. So um, if you've been following the John series, especially the podcast on my website, I have a website, kingdomupgrowth.com, 
And the reason I started this website and started blogging again a couple of years ago was because I wanted a place where I could feature, um, especially members of Churches of Christ who were doing good church-based research and to provide a forum to get their ideas out there. You know, I did a I did my doctorate at Lipscomb, and after I finished my dissertation, I'm fully convinced that Mike Doogie and my three readers are the only four people who've ever read my dissertation. But um, I thought, you know, there's got to be a way to get some of these ideas out there for people to see, because you do all this work, but then it doesn't go anywhere. So um, I started a website, and I have a section called Research Spotlight, where I'll find people who've completed some good original work, and then I'll invite them to do an interview where we talk about what they've learned, because I want it to be accessible uh, to, to the average Joe, so to speak. So uh, I'm going to be talking to a guy named Matt Carter. I'm interviewing him tomorrow. Um, it's not a live feed. I'm going to record it and then upload it over the next few days. But uh, Matt Carter has done some great work on um, like church member involvement, uh, helping people kind of uh, find their place in God's kingdom. And the angle that he's going at with this is where a lot of churches would use kind of spiritual gifts uh, inventories, they would call it. And uh, so I would encourage you, if you keep an eye on my website, this interview should be showing up uh, in my podcast and also you know, as a video you could watch on YouTube in the next few days. But um, I wanted to share just a couple of ideas that he shared that I found really helpful. Um, so one thing that I think makes it confusing for us is that in English, the word gift can mean two different things pretty normally. So it can either mean a present, like I gave you a birthday gift, a birthday present, or we would also use gift to describe a special ability or talent. In English, the same word does both things, and we wouldn't think about distinguishing uh, between the two. Now, um, Carter's uh, contention is that a lot of the things we're talking about as gifts, we tend to put the focus on the abilities side of gift when he would say, actually, what Paul's doing is putting the emphasis on the fact that it's something that's been given to them graciously. So he says the gifts shouldn't be thought of so much as a special ability, but really the actual ministry role that needed to be done. And some of the ministry roles that they may have needed in the early church are not all the same ministry roles that we currently need and some of the ones that we need. So I would mention Blake, who's doing a phenomenal job uh, getting all the polishing work done on the videos that we upload for each Sunday. He normally is back there running the sound booth. I'm really grateful that Blake um, has that, that gift of serving in the area of audiovisuals. That wasn't a role that existed in the early church. You know, so some of our needs are different, but he would contend that the real idea of a gift is actually the role itself. And so he would say that there's many, many things that are ministry roles, and there's really only a select group of those that we would read about in 1 Corinthians, for example, that required some sort of extra extraordinary uh, ability. So it's, it's an interesting take on this. And part of how he gets at this is the words that are used to talk about gifts. So uh, charisma is the word that shows up that most people would call spiritual gift. Paul uses this more than anyone else by a long shot, and it's actually not common outside of biblical literature, this word charisma. Many people would tie it into the word charis for grace and say that this is about God giving you a grace, which they're viewing as kind of a special you know, grace uh, ability, um, a grace gift. But he says there's actually a lot of linguistic evidence that this really doesn't come from charis so much as charizomai, which means to give graciously. So he says when we talk about the gifts, what it means is more like a present given to us graciously, not necessarily. It could possibly be a talent or ability, but that's definitely not the first thing we should think of when we read about the spiritual gifts in Scripture, that very often it's more of the role. So thinking about giving a gift, and look at the language in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11, and he gave, you know, he's, he's graciously given them uh, some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, teachers. And when you look at these things, um, these are all really functions within the church, and so uh, when you think of what the apostles were doing, the apostles were sent um, on behalf of God to be visionaries and church starters. And um, we don't have people in our church I would call an apostle, but that apostolic function of being someone who's visionary, who's trying to take the kingdom of God into new places and to teach, that is a function that we're still interested in. 
Um, the prophetic voice is one that's largely lost on us, but so much of what prophecy was about was not just kind of um, weird visions of the future. It's not all revelation type stuff. A lot of the function of prophets was really to remind people of what God had already told them and to encourage them to be true to that in their life uh, and, and in their worship. And so a prophetic voice is one that kind of helps you look at your own life and say, you know, here's some areas I've not really been aligning my heart with God. A prophetic voice is a very challenging voice. That is still kind of a, a functional voice that we need in the church. Uh, we have some people who are wonderful evangelists. Uh, we certainly have a role for shepherds and those who care for the flock. We have a role for people who are teachers. And so, again, I'm kind of leaning on what Matt tries to do in talking about. Um, there were some things in the first century that um, seemed to happen more often of more of an uh, ecstatic type nature, you know, like the gift of speaking in different languages. Um, tongue speaking, but there's a whole lot of these things that are much more about just serving a needed function in the body of Christ, much less about uh, some kind of uh, ability that you're going to show off. So, so many of these uh, spiritual gifts uh, inventories, and so um, let's see, uh, yeah, Cheryl, actually again, it's Randall speaking here. Um, he's mentioning a book, Discover Your God-Given Gifts. So this is the way that so many people have tried to talk about the gifts. It's like you got this thing hidden in there somewhere, and it's amazing, but you got to spend a lot of time trying to figure out like what it is and discover it. And Matt's making the case that, you know, really, there are just ministries that need to be done within the church, and the reason God has put you in the church is so that you can step up and fill those needs, and he's given you the ability to do that. And the reason that that's a gift is, is because just like our conversation about the priesthood, you've not been excluded from God's work. It's not that I've been saved and pushed to the side, but I've been saved and redeemed to the point that the way God is going to reach others is actually through my actions and our collective actions and the things that we do in the community uh, that we live as part of. So um, it is a gracious gift to have a function within the church. So uh, I'm going to talk with Leonard some next week about um, the conversation of like uh, a lot of people have talked about the spiritual gifts. And I think the dominant position in churches of Christ, certainly over the mid 1900s, was one of what you would call cessation. The idea that um, all spiritual gifts cease. We kind of took that to the point of wanting to say that the spirit did nothing apart from the words of scripture itself. And the problem with that is you end up getting into what I, um, the phrase I've seen, uh, that I think Leonard used, and I would affirm this, is what you might would call like Bible deism, where God is actually Father, Son, and Spirit, and Scripture is inspired by the Spirit. You know, it's God-breathed, but um, if you limit the Spirit to where the only thing he could have ever done for us is give us the Bible, then your new trinity becomes Father, Son, and Bible. Uh, but the Spirit is actually presented as a living and active member of the Godhead. So um, on the one hand, um, I think we should do what uh, John says um, in 1 John, 2 John, about um, you know testing the spirits. If someone claims to have a gift, I think they should be uh, subject to some scrutiny. I shouldn't just readily accept someone telling me they've got a word of the Lord for me. Um, but at the same time, I'm one who's really cautious about ever trying to tell God what he's not allowed to do. Right. And some of the ways we've over the last few decades, especially um, our movement has been, I think, a little overzealous to push back on any function of the Holy Spirit in our lives to the point that I think some of the stance we've taken doesn't actually resemble what Scripture describes that much. And again, I think King's Crossing it does a much better job than some churches I've encountered uh, on this topic. People seem to be very open uh, even to just using language to talk about the Spirit. You know, for, for so many, it's been the case where even though, you know, we would mention the Spirit wherever Scripture mentioned it when we read Scripture, but outside of Scripture talking about the Spirit, it's almost like it wouldn't even get discussed. So um, some examples, I'll just say that I think uh, sometimes... One of, the, one of the ways I think God works on our hearts is like, uh, do you ever have that experience of just having someone on your mind and you think about them and you feel like maybe you need to pray for them or call them and maybe you do only to discover that it was really important that you did? 
so I'll I'll mention a personal example. You feel a little vulnerable talking about this kind of stuff, but you know there's a there's a person uh, at our church. And um, I haven't asked his permission, so I won't share his name. Uh, it's happened to me probably six times now. Uh, it is not the case that he contacts me every Sunday. But there have been five or six different Sundays where I had something I was going to preach about. And truthfully, I felt nervous. Like I felt like I was maybe going to push an envelope a little bit. And I was trying to be true to Scripture, but I also didn't want to... Um, anger people needlessly. And, you know, I was going back and forth on, should I talk about this? Should I not talk about this? And so far, almost, I think just about every time I've had that mindset, this person has randomly texted me the Sunday morning I was going to deliver that message and said, hey, I don't know what you're preaching about this morning, but I want you to know I'm praying for you and I'm really anxious to hear what you've got to say. And I've not had any other correspondence with him. You know, I just trust that God put me on his heart at a time that I needed his encouragement, and I think God has encouraged me through that person. I like to believe that that is the Spirit of Christ alive in our church. So, um, you know, uh, we have people who all have all different types of viewpoints, and if that's not the kind of thing that uh, has happened to you, uh, you may want to see it differently. So, uh, yeah, Daniil, okay, you're referencing 1 Corinthians 12 and 13. Um so yeah, that, that's something I'm going to get into this a little bit more with uh, Leonard next week. But um, some of the more miraculous gifts, uh, again, th- people who want to do things like faith healing. You know, my big contention with uh, that group of guys I mentioned, Kenneth Copeland. If you're really going to get rid of the disease in the world and you're capable of that, why don't you go down to the hospital and do it there as opposed to you know in an empty auditorium where you're safe, you know, socially distanced from everyone who could have it, right? If you're actually going to heal people, then Show us what you got, you know. Um, so yeah, I have some I have some suspicion of people who want to pop up with some of the more ecstatic stuff, but at the same time, um, you can certainly go too far in wanting to limit the work of God uh, in our lives. So um, yeah, that's yeah. I told you I would. You could ask me anything; I'd give you my honest opinion. That's my honest opinion on some of that stuff. Uh, we're going to revisit this uh, big time next week. Next week's going to be all about uh, the Holy Spirit. And uh, Leonard Allen has thought about this. He's probably forgotten more about the Holy Spirit than I'll ever know. Uh, but he's going to be a wonderful conversation partner, and uh, really looking forward uh, to uh, having him. So, um, I think I've already kind of said uh, a lot of this. Uh, all gifts are manifestations of God's grace to his people. Not all require extraordinary uh, ex- extraordinary enabling. The Holy Spirit is portrayed in Scripture as living and active. Uh, we should not try to limit what the Spirit can do. You know, God can do what he wants to do. Uh, we should not limit our view of the gifts of the Spirit only to strange abilities. So I kind of shared my story a minute ago, but I think there's a lot more ways that the Spirit can help us, even more than we uh, realize. So, um, so yeah, I'll, I'll get back to 1 Corinthians 12 and 13. We'll try to touch on that some uh, next week. But, yeah, people try to look at passages. I think that's the one you're talking about where, like, once the perfect comes, the imperfect passes away. And even though there's no reason to make that apply to spiritual gifts, some people try to, you know, kind of force it onto that because that's what they wanted to think. But uh, we'll, we'll, look at, uh, we'll look at that passage some more. Uh, I would also mention something you might want to look at. Now, Kevin Burr, Dr. Kevin Burr, recently uh, finished his Ph.D., a good buddy of mine. He's actually been uh, sitting in with us on Wednesday nights. Uh, he's, I, I don't think his church is doing anything on Wednesday nights, so he's been kind of joining us. He made a really interesting presentation at Pepperdine back in uh, 2018 called The Ghost with the Most, uh, Spirit Indwelling and Demon Possession in Luke Acts. So, um I would just want to reference that, something you might want to consider. So I'm actually going to, I'm going to copy and paste this link in the comments feed. So if you guys are interested in listening to the podcast, you should be able to pull it right there on a, on a website. But um, this looks at some other mentions we're probably not going to get into um, having to do with things like demon possession. You know, talking about spirit indwelling is like the real positive side of this, but then there's also... Um, the other side of what about more nefarious forces in the universe. So um, that's an audio file. I think it was about an hour class. Um, Super interesting. He does some questions and answers at the end of it. Um, Yeah, okay. Thanks, Kevin. He says, I teach on Sundays. Our Wednesday p.m. study goes up 7 p.m. Eastern. Oh, okay. That's right. Yeah, you're in a different time zone. So you're you're finishing up and able to join us. So yeah, well, thanks for being here, Kev. So I'm making a plug for your uh, class there. So um, 
yeah, that's another resource for you to check out. And if you're interested, I'm also going to reference, I told you I'm going to be doing an interview with Matt Carter, so you're always welcome to listen to my conversation with him. It'll be shared all the same place that all these John podcasts have been. But um, I'm going to reference this. Dissertations are actually not that difficult to read. Uh, they're, they're all based on practical church work. So if you wanted to thumb through some of the stuff he was doing, talking about different ways to look at those terms for spiritual gifts, um, it, it's like in the first chapter. It's good stuff. It's, it's really well uh, written. So I'm sharing a link to that also. And um, let's see. I think that's all I had to cover for tonight. Yeah, I just wanted to make a final plug for uh, next week. Um, again, I'll have Leonard Allen and... Uh, Again, I, any time I can spend with Leonard has been uh, valuable time. So, yeah, uh, Pearly, thank you for thank you for being here. You're getting some nice some nice comments on here. Um, yeah, glad to have you tuning in. Hope you can join us again anytime. I would affirm what Rick is saying. We should work on growing our gifts. And if you think again about a gift as a ministry role, like God has given you the ability to serve in the church in a way that matters. That is a thing to grow in. And rather than always jumping from one thing to the next, what if you just said, here's an area where God is using me, and I'm going to get really good at this. Like, I'm going to persist in it. I'm going to study it. I'm going to think about it and pray about it and seek wisdom from others. What would happen if you just did that and took something seriously? So I could probably tip my hat, for example, uh, to Buck Griffith in the way that, you know, he got started in prison ministry, and the more he studied it, the more he learned about doing it, and he brought others with him. And that has become a, a really treasured ministry of our church for several decades now. Uh, on a national level, we've had some influence, but uh, that's a guy who kind of said, here's one thing I'm going to focus on and learn everything I can about it and pour a lot of energy into it. And if we grow our gifts, if we grow our ministry roles, uh, there's a lot of ways that God uses that, a lot of good that can come from that. So uh, very good. Well, yeah, and Daniil's making an important point. Yeah, I do need to mention that as we're wrapping up. Um, our goal is to have our first service back at the building on uh, the 17th. So we are uh, looking forward to being back there. Um, there's some stuff on the uh, there's some stuff on the uh, website. If you look under the COVID-19 section in Quick Links, uh, just some some updates from the elders. But uh, we we got more details coming your way very soon on uh, what we're going to be doing on the 17th. But uh, would uh, would encourage you to be praying about that. And uh, yeah, a lot of y'all are just making some nice uh, some nice comments here. So uh, yeah, appreciate everybody being here, weighing in. And um, yeah, we will we will <laughs> we will talk to everybody soon. I'm going to close us out with a word of prayer, and uh, we hope to see you again uh, next week. God, I thank you for uh, the many ways that you've gifted us, that you've graciously given us so many things. We're thankful that we can come to you in prayer, that Jesus and the Spirit intercede for us, and that we can approach you as children, uh, not just as servants or created beings, but really as as beings who can come to know you and walk with you. And so uh, I just pray that you'll be with all of us. I thank you for the chance to come together to talk about questions. Pray that you'll bless also our study uh, next week with Leonard. And uh, uh, just go with each of us the rest of this week. And uh, all these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. We'll see you guys soon. Yeah, we love and miss you too, Margaret. <laughs>